Um, today's talk is from the uh, Dhammapada, called the Yamakavaga. Uh, the subtitle is The Mind Governs All. The, uh, and this is the first chapter. The, the Dhammapada is a 26 chapter volume in uh, a book of the Sutta Pitaka called the Kudaka Nikaya, which is, it, it's simply a book of suttas that were difficult to classify in other ways. And there were also, most of them are very short. In this particular collection, the Dhammapada, um, it's just a wonderful book. It's a bit abstract. But when you read the whole Dhammapada, you realize that from the first chapter to the last chapter, we just covered the last chapter, by the way, a couple of weeks ago, it describes in beautiful detail an entire Dhamma practice. And it's only abstract when you don't understand the underlying context in, in the, the Eightfold Path. Um, this particular chapter, the first chapter, again, starts at the fourth foundation of mindfulness, the quality of mind. In other words, it describes this quality of mind. And then you can look at the rest of the Dhammapada as how to achieve that final quality of mind. And we talk about this often, the Satipatthana Sutta talks about it. We uh, reviewed it last week in the Anapanasati Sutta that the ultimate culmination of the Buddha's Dhamma is a mind resting in equanimity. That describes a quality of mind. It's not a, it's not a particular way of thinking. It's the result of, you could say, right thinking, of a well-concentrated mind whose thinking is now framed by reality, by the Eightfold Path. And that, that final quality, that fourth foundation of mindfulness is equanimity, and that's what this is referring to. Um, and then I'll talk about the Truth of Happiness course after, the, after this talk. The Yamakavaga, the Buddha's words. The quality of mind precedes all mental states. That's perhaps one of the most profound teachings in all of Buddhism. Because it teaches the essence of the Dhamma. The, it, it teaches from the fourth foundation of mindfulness. It teaches from that awakened point of view, right view. The quality of mind precedes all mental states. If the quality of my mind is resting in reality, if my mind is well concentrated through an authentic Dhamma practice, through an authentic jhana practice, then that quality of mind precedes all mental states that will follow. This is why I say over and over again, and why the Buddha teaches that the Dhamma is practiced at the point of contact because it's only at the point of contact, meaning what's occurring right now in my life with my mind united in my body that will determine how I experience my life. And if, if in this moment, my mind is rooted in reality, then this will be a calm and peaceful mind and it will feed the next calm and peaceful mind. So that one sentence um, is an entire Dhamma teaching when you understand the context of it. The Buddha continues. Mind is the governing principle, meaning what we hold in mind. That's true mindfulness. And when the Buddha talks about mindfulness, he's not referring to a broad general mindfulness that we, uh, th that is almost another, uh, almost encouraging further grasping, meaning that we should be mindful of everything that's occurring moment by moment. That's not what the Buddha means by mindfulness. The Buddha means, what the Buddha means by mindfulness and what he teaches as we find mindfulness is a mind that is well concentrated, that can hold in mind all eight factors of the Eightfold Path as your way of living in the world. That's true mindfulness. Mind defines all phenomena. Of course, mind doesn't create phenomena, it defines it. What does, it, what does the Buddha mean? What does this mean by that? It means that, again, how we, what we're holding in mind will define our, our, the life that we're living as our life unfolds. And if, our, if the quality of our mind is rooted in wisdom of the, eight, of the Eightfold Path of Four Noble Truths, then that will inform this moment. If our mind is still rooted in ignorance, then what it will give birth to, the true meaning of birth in, in the Buddhist teachings, what it will give birth to is another moment rooted in ignorance. Mind governs all. Is it a quick question, Michael? Yes, yes it is. Great. I don't mean to interrupt you, but I just want to make, just going back to just what you had said before about as life occurs, right? Mm -hmm. And in the meantime, we consider uh, there's a terminology that was used 
come to someone, I can't grab them from this, but like a mundane consciousness of just things that occur and uh, just to be aware of the surroundings, the moment, and a sense of awareness basically yeah. at all times. That, that's how a human mind works without any intervention. In other words, or the, the human thinking process in the mundane is, is also much like the mind working like our heart works. We don't have to think about every, every pump of our heart in order for it to pump. We don't have to think about our thinking, but that's the essence of preoccupation, isn't it? We do think about our thinking. When we develop the Dhamma, we have freed ourselves from that type of clinging to each thought. And then we are living in reality from the point of view of a calm and peaceful mind. In other words, we're not constantly grasping after everything that's occurring because we're not taking anything personal. It's an important question and an important point. I think you've heard me say that one of the, there's great freedom in developing the Eightfold Path because once you have integrated the Eightfold Path, and I'm not talking about the culmination of the path. I mean, and most of us have talked about this very quickly. You realize that when you're acting within the framework of the Eightfold Path, you don't have to be concerned about your own actions or your own thoughts. You know that they're not going to cause any harm or distress for yourself or others. Why? Because they're framed by the Eightfold Path. That's how, it, that's how the, the Dhamma achieves a calm and peaceful mind. We simply know who we are in relation to the world and we know we're, we know we're not going to screw up. <laughs> because we're, our thinking is framed properly. And that's an awareness, that's an awareness. That's, uh, yeah, another way, word for that is, is an understanding. We, under, we understand how our mind works. The mind governs all. Thank you. Thank you. If a person speaks or acts with an impure mind, suffering will follow like a wheel following an oxen's hoof. Makes sense, doesn't it? The quality of mind precedes all mental states. Mind is the governing principle mind defines all phenomena. If a person speaks or acts with a pure mind, happiness will follow like a constant shadow. So every human being from the moment they're born wants happiness. The problem is we don't understand how to get it. We think that we can, a mind rooted in ignorance thinks that it can achieve happiness by acquiring things and situations and positions in the world. Of course, because those are all fleeting, no matter what it is, the biggest pile of gold is still fleeting. Because of that, there can be no lasting happiness. The only lasting happiness, as the Buddha is teaching here, as he teaches throughout his Dhamma, is by developing a quality of mind rooted in reality that understands the arising and passing away of all phenomena. Mind governs all phenomena. When the mind understands phenomena, meaning the world we live in, then that mind is at, at peace from understanding. That's... that. It, Developing a common peaceful mind through understanding is the antithesis of, of feeling that you're gaining control of the world through acquisitions and the things that you think you can control. You can feel the tension in that, other, that, that way of living in the world, can't you? As opposed to simply understanding. From the outside, it might look the same to yourself and to others. But when you're not clinging to the things of the world and not clinging to your views, when you're simply present for your life as your life unfolds with that mundane thinking taken care of, then you're at peace. Then every moment of your life is a meaningful moment solely because you're in it, you're living it. Right, right there. The potential for liberation resides in each moment that occurs. Who said that? That's brilliant. <laughs> Someone on that board did. <laughs> the Buddha continues. Yeah. Harboring thoughts of being abused. This is, this is such an important point of the Dhamma. And it so contradicts 2,600 years of so-called psychological practice. One of that is the encouragement that we should start um, examining our feelings and where do they come from and what's the root of it and who's to blame for it in some cases. Rather than the Buddha teaches, feelings and thoughts arise and pass away. There's nothing personal about them except that we make them personal. Let me read that again. If a person speaks or acts with a pure mind, happiness will follow like a constant shadow. It's up to us. It's not up to any external circumstance 
how we experience the quality of our mind. It has to do with understanding. Harboring thoughts of being abused, meaning the, the, the world is against me, the world isn't fair. Robbed, injured, or overpowered does not still hatred. Although we do that automatically, don't we? We take things personal. We think some, this is happening to me or the world is against me. Those who harbor such thoughts will remain agitated. Abandoning thoughts of being abused, robbed, injured, or overpowered always stills hatred. There's this somewhat modern phenomena called engaged Buddhism. I and mean, really what it is, is a, a, it's a way of living your life in protest, putting a Buddhist label on it that makes that, that constant feeling of being abused as okay. 2,600 years ago, the Buddha talked about that. It said, you're just rooted in ignorance when you look at life that way, when you take anything personal. And that doesn't mean that we shouldn't, um, someone sent me, or they commented on a YouTube video, kind of making that point that there's still some value in, in striving for a better social fabric. That's not quite the words he used. And of course there is, but the most powerful impact a human being can have on the societal social fabric is to take to the Dhamma and awaken. Because that mind now is conflict free and a mind that is conflict free can no longer contribute to the conflict in the world. But a mind that is rooted in ide ideology, no matter how altruistic that ide ideology might be, has to contribute to the conflict in the world because it's always in opposition to something rather than understanding there's nothing to be in opposed to. I think I shocked a few people a few weeks ago when I said, I don't see any good in the world. Uh, I don't. And I don't see any bad in the world because there isn't. There is only what's occurring. And you could say, well, what about, what about poverty or the, 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 the continuing remnants of racism or misogyny? That's just part of the human lexicon. It doesn't mean that it's right or wrong. The Buddha describes it and we understand it because that's a world rooted in ignorance of Four Noble Truths. That's the most profound understanding we can come to. And when we understand that, we will not be opposed to anything except ignorance of Four Noble Truths. Then we can get somewhere. It always stills hatred. The Buddha continues, hatred always con continues hatred. Think about what's going on just in this country today. There's two opposing sides, both with Messiah complexes, both taking the stand that I'm the pure one and everything that opposes me is evil. Hatred never ends hatred. And look at the hatred that just keeps building and building in, this, in our country and really across the world because we've taken this position. We've gone from almost an under, a, a bit of an understanding that life is gonna to be tough to now, if anybody opposes me, I hate you. This, what do you call it, the cancel culture now. We're getting further and further removed from resolving the problem of ignorance, aren't we? And we're justifying it by me thinking that I'm gonna save the world if everybody would just listen to me or the group that I represent or that I attach myself to. How could that be? Even if the underlying ideology is, is good, I'm not going to say pure because it can't be that way, you're still in opposition. You're still creating conflict in the world. No matter what you're proposing, you're still against somebody. That creates conflict. It creates tension. We've been trying since the beginning of humankind to end human ignorance by creating rules and laws and structures. It doesn't work, does it? It simply creates more tension for people and it comes out in different ways. This notion that, and it's so pervasive today, and people will argue me, I probably shouldn't even go here, but I'm gonna, because I started going in this direction and I can't stop. Um, the idea that all religions are basically the same is, this is the main reason for extreme religions to act the way they're acting because they don't want to be there. They have a very strong self-reference to that, whatever that religious ideology is. And when you insist that, yeah, that's just the same as mine, it gets people upset, doesn't it? Because it's not true. And it's not true in the, um, in the abstract sense. 
people have a right to believe that their religion is whatever they want to believe it in. And if they believe that that's the one true religion, okay, that's fine. I don't need to oppose it. I understand that the notion, that entire notion is rooted in ignorance of four noble truths, but I don't have to oppose it, do I? I can maintain a, con, a calm and peaceful mind and not contribute to the conflict that that type of ideology brings into the world. And it's the same type of ideology that says, I'm a Democrat, I'm right, I'm a Republican, I'm right, I'm whatever I might be, whatever it is. As soon as I decide that I'm right and you're wrong, I've introduced conflict in the, in the world, even if I'm right. Even if I'm right, because I'm making you wrong. And that's the, that's the ultimate um, subtlety that the Buddha is teaching here. It's not enough to have an altruistic, compassionate way of living in the world if our minds are still rooted in ignorance. And again, look, you, you, the, the perfect examples would be the Crusades or the modern day jihads. The people that engage in those things think that they are absolutely right and that they're somehow contributing to saving humanity by doing that. I'm, I don't know so much about modern jihad because I'm not in that. I can see the results of it. But I do know a lot about the, um, the crusade type mentality that led to destroying complete cultures, particularly the Hawaiian culture. I, I happen to know a lot about that. I, I, I became friends with a lot of people that were trying to maintain the, uh, the Polynesian Hawaiian culture. And what, what people did on the, with the notion that they were going to save these poor savages that they found in Hawaii by converting them to Christianity was the most cruelest thing anybody could do. And the fact of the matter is those savages back, I mean, I'm talking about going into the 1600s, had a worldwide economy. They were sophisticated. They didn't need anybody to save them. I mean, they were warring amongst themselves. There was always a lot of wars between the islands, but they didn't need anybody to save them. But that, it was that idea that, that comes from this notion that I know better than someone else. The Bodhisattva vow even applies in it that. It does. Well, thanks for bringing it up. Maybe Maybe, I that's maybe the most but relevant application of it, right? The, excuse me. Since you brought it up, Kevin, thank you. The, the um, the most modern way to enter Mahayana Buddhism today, Mahayana covers Zen and Tibetan and you know, those practices, um, is by the way of the Bodhisattva vow. And the Bodhisattva vow is it typically goes like this: I will put aside my own awakening until all sentient beings are awakened. It sounds wonderfully altruistic, doesn't it? And it contradicts everything the Buddha says. Even the Buddha himself, when he referred to himself as a bodhisattva or bodhisattva, the Pali, is as prior to my awakening, when I was an unawakened bodhisattva, what that means, and it makes this point very clear and perfectly well, is that I may have a great compassionate heart. Most human beings do. That's a bodhisattva, deep concern for other human beings. But the Buddha is referring to as an unawakened bodhisattva as not having the understanding of what it means to be a human being. And so you will create great conflict in the world with that view. I'm out here to save the world. Or I'm not going to awaken because of all the other poor souls that can't awaken. Well, the Buddha taught just the opposite too. He taught that you awaken, then you can truly help other people. Thank you. I took that vow, by the way, and I very quickly disavowed it when I understood what I was doing. Hatred always continues hatred. Non-hatred alone ends hatred. This law is timeless. Again, if we really want to end conflict in the world, we have to end it within ourselves. Many ignore the fleeting nature of life. The wise who understand impermanence do not quarrel over others. Can you think of a bigger waste of time than fighting with other people over your, over your own ideology? Just as a strong wind will fail a weak tree, Ignorance will consume those living for sensual pleasures. Consume those. Lacking restraint, gorging on food, lazy. Buddha doesn't mince any words here, does he? Just as a strong wind does not affect a rocky mountain, ignorance will never cling to those who are mindful of the defilements, wise in restraint, moderate with food, 
with conviction for the Dhamma and tireless in their efforts. Those ignorant, depraved, lacking restraint, dishonest, though wearing a disciple's robe, are not worthy of respect. Again, the Buddhist teaching that no matter what you do, you have to be authentic. You can wear the robes, you can shave your head, you can do all the rites and rituals, you can make it look real good on the outside. But if the inside is still rooted in mindlessness, you gotta okay. practice. You gotta practice. You gotta do this. You gotta do what we're doing. Those who have abandoned ignorance and depravity in control of their senses, established in virtue, they alone are worthy of respect. They are Dhamma practitioners. Those that crave for and cling to what is worthless and ignore what is priceless, mindful only of what is rooted in ignorance, will never realize the Dhamma. And that includes not just clinging to the things of the world, it also includes, and this is an underlying theme of the Buddhist Dhamma, clinging to false dharmas, meaning fabricated dharmas, but a dharma is not just um, a Buddhist practice in this sense. A dharma is any overarching belief that you have that you must fit into. Another way of saying that is any fabrication is a false dharma because you are in, you've, you've made this fabrication of yourself. And since you've made it, you're now prone to worship it, protect it, defend it, even though you've made it up, this view of yourself in relation to the world. Those that know the heartwood, and the Buddha's talking about heartwood, he's always referring to the Eightfold Path. Those that know the heartwood to be heartwood and sapwood to be sapwood, established in refined mindfulness, they will realize the Dhamma. Just as rain will rot a poorly roofed house, passion will rot a poorly developed mind. Just as rain will, will not rot a properly roofed house, passion will never destroy a properly developed mind. Mind governs all. The, the ignorant, hurtful in thoughts, words, and deeds, suffers endlessly. Afflicted with regret, always mindful of misdeeds. The wise, pure in thought, word and deed, rejoice endlessly. They are at peace. Always mindful of the benefits of restraint. Always mindful of the benefits of restraint. The ignorant, hurtful in thoughts, words and deeds, suffers endlessly. Mindful of misdeeds, constantly tormented. The wise, pure in thought, word and deed, are always delighted. Mindful of the purity, they are constantly delighted. Why? Because there's nothing in that moment, in that quality of mind, I have not put anything between me and pure happiness, meaning being present with my life as life occurs. It's the only place that happiness can be meanfully, meaningfully <laughs> established. How could it be otherwise? When you understand the Dhamma, and you understand that the past is fabricated, the future is fabricated, always will be. The only place that I can find peace and fulfillment in my life is right here and right now. The problem is that a mind, my mind rooted in ignorance never wants to be here. It always wants more of something or less of something, no matter what it is. It's always evaluating, is this, is this something good for me or bad for me? Rather than this is something that is here for me whatever it is. I don't have to judge it in any way and be at peace with what's occurring and what's occurring in the world too, because I understand the nature of the world. I understand the nature of suffering. I know it's going to be a part of the world because I understand ignorance. I understand the phenomenal world. Let me finish up. I'm sorry. Sorry, John. How you doing? Uh, I just want to know what sutta are you, are you pulling from? This is called the Yamakavaga. It's the first chapter of the Dhammapada. Oh, gotcha. Roger. It's, thank in, you. it's in the email if you want to, if you have it handy, you can click on it. Okay, thanks. It's called Mind Governs All. It, it starts out with, this, with the Buddhist saying or, or teaching that the fourth foundation of mindfulness, the quality of mind is what governs everything. And so in the Dhammapada, it builds from that first chapter to the 26th chapter as a complete Dhamma teaching, but the Buddha's beginning with saying, this is what we're after. 
<coughs> this quality of mind that, that is, is never shaken by anything. Good to see you, thing. Much though they read sacred texts, but acting poorly, overcome by greed, they do not gain the benefits of the heart. Why is that, Kevin? Because they're disturbed by the lower fetters. Yeah, and just reading the Dhamma is not going to develop anything in you, is it? That's just reading. We ha as the Buddha says, I have to yes, we have to take it to ourselves and apply it. Again, it's not a religion. Nothing's taken on faith. Tim, you had a to overcome by greed, and that's a defilement. I mean, there it just states it right there. I mean, um, if they self, having any kind of self referential view of any false dhamma, it, it's going to have it, yep. those defilements are right up front, so you can never achieve that. Yes, and and the 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 subtlety of understanding that though cannot be done by a mind that is rooted in ignorance, because a mind that is rooted in ignorance is is bound to crave for and cling for more. And so a simple, you know, the, the Dhamma is pretty simple and basic. And I think one of the reasons why many people have some, such difficulty, why they want to keep it, embellishing it and changing it is because its simplicity is not enough for most people. There needs to be more to it. There needs to be some mystical or magical connotations to this. And that goes to that underlying notion of self-loathing that we all think there's something wrong with us. So I need to find a practice or a religion or a philosophy that can fix me or better me because I'm not good at, as I am. When the Buddha teaches, you can never change what you are. Every human being is simply six properties. Everything else is how we decide to live our lives. You can never change it and we shouldn't try. <clears throat> this is such an important, a beautiful line too. Little though they read sacred texts, but putting the Dhamma into practice, abandoning greed, aversion, and deluded thinking, the three defilements, with true wisdom, their mind free from ignorance, clinging to nothing in this world or any other. Another important line, the idea of, of establishing yourself in speculative non-physical realms. The Buddha consistently, and I mean a lot, over and over and <coughs> over again says, don't go there. Or any other world, this one has gained the benefits of the well-integrated life, meaning the well-integrated with the Eightfold Path. Uh, yeah, I thought that was the end. That's the end of this remarkable sutta. Um, the, uh, Tuesday, I'm going to do the second chapter, and we've done a few of these. Right after our spring retreat, um, we're going to do the entire Dhammapada. We'll spend 13 weeks going through the 26 chapters over the summer and then I think in the fall we're going to do a, a strict study just on John but that's what's coming up um, we're all gaining an understanding and I think I, I think this, this study the Vipassana structured study really helped us along that it what we're looking at what we're developing is a way of establishing a quality of mind that is unaffected by the world we live in. That's true control, but it's a very gentle control. It's not a grasping type of control. It's not a fear-based control. Through under, a mind rooted in understanding is also free of fear because it, it, it understands who it is, what it is in relation to the world. There's no grasping because there's nothing to acquire. It kind of governs itself. It, it, mind governs all. And the Vitaka Santana Sutta, the Buddha teaches, we gain the ability to think what we want to think when we want to think it. That's so important. Michael. Uh, just before we move on to the, uh, moving on to two patterns. Uh, yes. Well, a little bit. First, we're going to go around the room. Uh, okay. Uh, I'll just use this point in time as my going around the room. Okay. Uh, I don't have to. <laughs> okay. Uh, I just, just referring back to the beginning of the sutta, uh, and I'll just read this small passage here, and then I'll bring, I'll bring, to, uh, bring something up about it. The quality of mind precedes all mental states. Mind is the governing principle. Mind defines all, pheno all phenomena. If a person speaks or acts with a pure mind, happiness will follow like a constant shadow. The big word in this whole thing is pure. 
and the, the path to purifying the mind is that's a that's a an aware a constant awareness of uh, the eight, the eightfold path integrated uh, and flowing from there, and it's every conflict, no matter how large or small, or, or discord that exists in our minds, has to be basically in check or um, res resolved at that point before our mind can be pure. A pure mind is a extremely deeply introspective cleansing of our, of our mind. Yeah. So, I mean, I know it's, it's mentioned here, but I think I, I think there is an emphasis that needs to be placed on it because it, it is an actual acute awareness uh, as life occurs and unfolds. Yeah, and the, the Buddha mentions that in many different ways. The again, the problem though, having a pure mind to a mind that isn't pure seems like that's impossible. How could I ever have a mind like that? Of course, it's just, it's just that. It's not, it's not unattainable, a pure mind. It needs a proper framework. When the Buddha awakened, as he taught every other human being awakened, he touched the, and there's a lot made of this gesture, but usually when you see, uh, it's not, <coughs> you see pictures depicting the Buddha awakened, you'll see his left hand, this pointing up towards the sky, his right hand touching the the earth or touching the ground next to him. What he's symbolizing is I have overcome the world. I'm no longer entangled. I'm above worldly entanglements. That's what he's showing there. And he simply means that he realizes who he is in relation to the world and he's not clinging himself to the world. That's pure. It's not something that is beyond human capabilities, but the word itself shows a necessity to root out all aspects of ignorance. But how do we, we don't, again, we're not doing it on our own. We're doing it through a methodical practice or path called an Eightfold Path. When the Buddha awakened, he said, there's nothing left within me to provoke further ignorance, which means he has purified his own mind. <laughs> you have a question? Yeah, just uh, uh, maybe you could explain this uh, to me. <clears throat> so that also has like, before we, uh, any of us, and obviously you haven't been in this as long as you might be in deep path, but uh, before in um, starting like this practice, you know, uh, there is a or and, and this practice leads you to become more aware. Obviously, that's what we're here for to become aware. Um, all of us, I do believe, uh, have a a karmic field, you know, that we seeded with ignorance. Yes. Yeah. So until that, that karmic field is, um, is pure of ignorance, ignorance or it's that, that, uh, that, that karma is resolved, there will be, uh, there won't be purity of mind. Oh, I gotta, I gotta, I don't mean to, inter I do mean to interrupt you, but I, I'm not trying to be rude. Um, we're going to get to a teaching on karma and rebirth, but karma, the, the, your, you're describing karma like it has some inherent power, oh. which is how most people see karma, but that's a complete misunderstanding. Karma is simply the present moment unfolding, unfolding of past intentional acts moderated by the present level of mindfulness, meaning that a conditioned mind creates impetus towards action and reaction, no matter what's occurring in its life. What I'm saying is that what's occurring right now is not punishment or reward for something I did eight minutes ago or 800 lifetimes ago. My experience of what's occurring right now is karma, meaning that my life is unfolding because of choices and decisions I've made my entire life, including to get up out of bed this morning and come here. My experience of what's occurring right now, my karmic experience, is informed by the quality of mind, which is what the Buddha is talking about. So it has nothing to do with what I did or what I might have done or the merit or the prayers that I gave or the bows that I've done that I'm gaining a reward. 
my experience, my karma in this moment has to do with the quality of mind in this moment, nothing else. And so the, if, if it was anything else, there'd be no way to end, so -called, end that idea of karma being punishment or reward. It would just be this endless system that drags human beings through it forever. Buddha recognized that's just nonsense. There's nothing, there's nothing outside it acting on me. There's no agency that's preventing me from pure happiness. Including the including my past actions, the one of the, I think it's probably the most pernicious and cruel thing that anybody ever teaches, is that you got to pay for your sins with endless suffering. The Buddha realized how what nonsense that was, and there's so many good examples, but one of them that comes to mind is Angela Miller, the murderer. Angela Miller had everybody knew he was this bloodthirsty murderer, living in the same area as the Buddha. And he had killed 99 people, really, people we don't really know exactly, but this is the story. And he cut the, 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 his murdered victim's fingers off and made this bloody necklace that he wore around. So people knew he was Angela Miller, the murderer. And one day he's walking down the road looking for number 100 and he spots the Buddha. And I won't go to, it's a rather long, so I won't tell the whole story. And he decides, well, the Buddha is going to be number 100. I'm going to get him. And there's a kind of a long story that he can't quite reach the Buddha. And every time he gets a little close, the Buddha moves away. But eventually they come together. The Buddha gives Angela Milla a very brief teaching. Angela Milla awakens on the spot, never harms another person. Now, the, the popular belief in karma would say, well, wait a minute. He can't awaken yet. He's got to suffer at least as much as he made other people suffer. That's how karma is often presented, right? Has nothing to do with that. Karma is not a, a, a universal system of, of reward and punishment. Karma is simply what I said. It's the present moment unfolding of past intentional actions moderated by the present level of my, of my consciousness, which means that in this moment, I can liberate myself from any ignorant thoughts, words, or deeds. Think about that. <coughs> it makes the burden a lot lighter. It makes the burden, even if you're someone who... In, in this moment has killed 99 other I don't think anybody here has. <laughs> but even if you are, it's not for me to say you got some problems. What I can do is tell you, listen, learn this and you'll probably won't hurt another person. But most importantly, you'll never hurt yourself again. You'll end conflict in yourself. That's what changed Angela Miller. It wasn't fear. It wasn't penis punishment. It wasn't a hundred Hail Marys. It was changing the way. I'm not putting that down, by the way. I don't, I, the reason why I'm saying it, I think, is because I said about a million Hail Marys. It never got me out of anything. <laughs> it's by changing the quality of our mind. Quality of mind governs all. John, isn't that what the, the Pursuta was, was referring to exactly? It, the whole Dhamma refers to it. The whole teachings on the four foundations of mindfulness. Teach, the whole teachings on jhana teach this. Uh, let me go to Mary first. Mary, how are you? Good morning, John. Good morning, everyone. Good morning, Mary. <laughs> um, I'm very well, and uh, <laughs> I feel like I say this each time. This was a wonderful sutra. Um, you do say it every time. <laughs> um, but it, the, the, the significance of the quality of mind is made clear. Um, it's applicable to our lives it's something we can all take with us from this reading and preparing for today and from this discussion and um you know in this moment it feels like a i don't know if linchpin is the right word but it sure is an important factor toward the gateway of enlightenment i would think and um but presented in a way that is practical and reasonable for us to take forward off our cushions um, immediately. So thank you very much for this wisdom and uh, I look forward to listening to everyone else. Yeah. Thank you, Mary. And you, you picked up that this was a really good lead in into the truth of happiness. And I thought it was good. <laughs> yes. Thad, how are you? Thad from Texas. Hello, Thad. Oh. Do I need to unmute your... Hello, John. There you are. How are you? Uh, very fine. Uh, fine, thank you. Uh, once again, just uh, listening to the comments is uh, is uh, uh, very, very, uh, very good. I like that, uh, the, the fact that I can learn from that. Uh, yeah. And 
I think I'll just continue doing that here as, as you go on. This, uh, this is, a, is a great introduction to, uh, uh, to, the, to the book. Thank yeah. you. Thank you, Ben. Thanks for joining. Dave, how are you, David? Hey, good morning, John. Can you hear me? I can. Hey, uh, I just think that this course coming up dovetails so well with the past 35 weeks. So I look forward to it uh, for new practitioners and experienced ones. Uh, it's just a good restart, reset, and I look forward to it. Thank you. I do too. Thanks, David. Last but not, not least online is Thane. How are you this morning? I'm great. I'm great. Hey, how you doing? Uh, good. It's good um, to see you. Yeah, I'm, I'm, uh, yeah, as I was, as I was, um, as I was listening, um, I too, I'm, uh, karma is something which I'm, um, intrigued by, um, and how it's, uh, presented, um, and I think you presented pretty well. The, the thing that, that I'm, I'm curious, the thing that I'm curious about, you, you, you know, the, um, the, <laughs> Agulamala, the serial killer suited. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, um, the one thing that that that's kind of um, that just, at least in, the, in, a, in, a, in a common, not just in the common sense, but um, also in a way which is um, uh, from the Sudas as well, is um, I, I love your idea. I mean, the, the idea that you have that you know you yourself can become liberated from your own actions if you have a clarity of mind, um, yes. rather than thinking that something else some th something else is going to punish you um your choices and actions um through practice you know you can be you can be liberated from that the thing that um and this is actually i feel different than the the christian um perspective um like when you you know when jesus saves me um for example uh and, and you are uh are able to um be forgiven for all your sins um through that faith act the thing in buddhism and i like to kind of kind of comment further is um while you are you have become awakened or freed from your ignorance that doesn't mean that the consequences of your actions stop like i like gulama is a perfect example if i'm not mistaken even after his awakening people re still regarded him <laughs> <laughs> as the serial killer and he wasn't he didn't have a he didn't have a a, a stress-free life from others but but like you said it's not as if there's some type of overarching overarching um uh punishment that's happening it is the consequences of his actions that is that is that is also um that, that is creating this issue uh, well, i watch just say creating creating the um suffering coming from from what he's done but he himself is not in uh, fueling that suffering with her actions. So I don't know, that's something I want you to, that's the first thing I want to want you to talk about. And, well, and, let, me, and let me talk about that first then. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, and it's such a good point to think. The, the, and the, this sutta and the whole Dhamma speaks to it. The Buddha taught Angela Miller how to, how to end that incredible conflict in his own mind, develop a calm and peaceful mind through the Dhamma so that he wasn't provoking himself towards killing others. His mind remained calm and at peace. It's up to other people how they might take him and whether they want to continue to hate him or not. And you can get into the whole, uh, there, of course, it's okay to hate him because of all the terrible things. That's still on that person. And, and, and an awakened human being, Angela Miller in that case, would not be concerned about things that he has no, no, no concern in, meaning how other people take take him there's people um in my family that still see see me the way i was when i was from 40 years ago which was a crazy drunken drug addicted teenager and i'm still that way to some people in my family you know and, and i'm not that way they and they know it but so what it, it doesn't affect the quality of my mind and that's the that's the whole point there were people during the buddha's lifetime i mean think about this that, that wanted to and tried to kill him. Even there's, there's a story of, of David Dada twice tried to kill his cousin, the Buddha, mm -hmm. out of greed because he wanted that position. So the, the outplaying of karma, if you want to understand karma, take a good look in the mirror, meaning look at your life. That's your karma. Mm -hmm. And do you want it to continue? If you're happy with it, 
keep doing what you're doing. If you'd like to change how your karma is unfolding, how, meaning how your life is unfolding moment by moment, the only way to actually change that is to change the way you think because that's what's contributing to your actions. That's karma. Karma means actions. And any moment through going from wrong view to right view, wrong thinking to right thinking, I'm changing my actions, I'm changing my thoughts, words, and deeds, and so I'm changing my karma. That's, the, that's really the only teaching we need to know about karma. Because if, if anything else, such as seeing karma as a behavior, a universal behavior modification system, you've lost the dollar. It doesn't make any sense. So you had something, I hope that was helpful to Thane, and you had another question? Or comment? Yeah. Um, yeah. The the karma in relation to rebirth and and as as I um as I said I think on, on another occasion um I'm I'm it's refreshing that the Buddha you know doesn't doesn't go into a lot of metaphysical kind of statements or I mean it's a very phenomenological kind of like events observational type of practice and teaching which is very refreshing um and really differs from other um religions which is why even calling it a religion it, uh is 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 maybe a misnomer um but, it's more like a, a like a practice like a, almost like a scientific practice in a sense yeah. um for liberation um but there is something you know um that when you read the text you know, there is some type of metaphysical um, kind of stances maybe takes just on that this is the kind of way that the whole society kind of, or his time kind of took it. Like, for example, there's this the one sutta that, I, that I'm looking at right now, uh, the, Ma, the Maha uh, Nidana Sutta, the Greater Causes Discourse. And he talks about how the consciousness, you know, will, will from death, will enter the womb stream of consciousness. I don't necessarily this mean like your soul or anything. This, I don't think that's what, he, that's what this means, but the stream of consciousness goes from, you know, uh, your, your, from your death to your mother's womb and in, to the embryo. Um, you know, as I'm reading now, you know, from consciousness requisite condition, name and form, thus said, you know, understanding consciousness requisite comes from name and form, thus uh, descends into the mother's womb and will take form into shape of the mother's womb. So. So it's, it's interesting. There is something which you have to kind of um, uh, with karma, uh, and 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 I think it's it's hard to disconnect it from rebirth because actions and consequences is something which one has to kind of connect. That there is some type of um metaphys. I don't know if we want to accept that um, in the present moment, which makes me think of the Buddha as a human being with coming from his time and and keeping it rather than an omniscient being. But um, there is some type of um, uh, metaphysical stances that maybe he takes just as a way of just navigating um, his time because th it's just like, you know, people believe that there's gravity, you know, yeah. in our time. It's just something that he just doesn't question. So once you could, could you kind of comment on that? Um, well, it is that last thing that it, 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 he used the word karma in a, in a, because it was a common term, but in a completely contradictory way. And depending on your translation, I don't believe the Buddha would have taught that the way that that was that Nyana Panaka Thera's. Yeah, uh, the, 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 the Maha uh, Nidana. Yeah, yeah. Nidana. Um, so all the, all the Buddha is describing there is the beginning of, the, of thinking. And he's saying that it happens when you're at conception. There's nothing magical or mystical or metaphysical about that. But when you're thinking, when you're translating and your thinking is rooted in that, that's how you're going to write it out that there's some, some magical force that's coming through, that's putting this consciousness into the mother's womb. Well, a, 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 a medical doctor would describe the same thing as at some point during gestation, you start thinking. There's nothing magical about it. And then the other thing about rebirth, the, uh, the, there's hundreds and hundreds of references where the Buddha says, don't ever even think about any non-physical reality. And so how do you reconcile that with his teachings on rebirth? You understand it in, in the context of what he's saying. The Buddha has never talked about a future physical birth. His whole idea of, what, of birth is what are we giving birth to in this moment? And if our minds are rooted in ignorance, we're going to give birth to another moment in ignorance. That's called the living death of ignorance. And if our minds are rooted in understanding of four noble truths, then we will give birth to a moment inclined towards awakening. And that's the only type of birth that the Buddha considers.
He has, he has no, con no concern about a future birth because his intention is that we awaken right here, right now. But 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 John, don't you don't you feel that that I mean, for me as a as a modern thinker, that makes more make that makes more sense. Obviously, I mean, and now that it makes more sense, it that's very pal palpable to me. But don't you think that we're kind of putting our our modern thinking onto the past? That um that there are some things in 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 the suttas which the Buddha may have taken for as um historical fact or as 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 a metaphysical reality. But 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 his view is really questioning the phenomenological one. Don't you feel that that maybe that that's what we have a that's what tends because we will we would like to believe in that way. Um, I I think about that and I think that's that's a possibility. There's no way of ultimately knowing that. So the only thing that I can do, um, and I remember when I kind of realized this while I was reading the suttas, is look for the underlying consistency. I talked to Ram about that. And what the Buddha actually awakened to, and then then pay attention to what he's saying in the suttas, which is over and over again. Even in this sutta, don't go into any type of speculation. They, there's so many suttas about that. The thing, all of the suttas on on jhana, which there's dozens of them. Every one of them, he says, don't do that. In his in his description of his own awakening, he he talks about the foolishness of going into non-physical or speculative realms including the idea of birth. And if you, under, if you read what he says, the most important aspect to understand is what we are giving birth to in this moment, because it's the only place that we can awaken or, or make any kind of change in our lives is right here and right now. We're gonna, and at, at the end of this study, we're gonna spend a, a, a week or two on karma and rebirth too. We'll get into it a little deeper, but. Okay, thank you. Important questions, thank you. Mm -hmm. Kevin. Uh, just to continue on, what you were just saying, I, I feel that the, the teachings on dependent origination really do, with, with enough study and clarity, resolve karma. And, and that's it where it's that's resolved. What it's, about. It's, it's right here. We're giving birth to another moment yeah. rooted in wisdom, not ignorance. And therefore, our experience is of unbinding five aggregates, simply experiencing life yeah. and sitting on a cushion in concentration, practicing jhana informing our mindfulness yep. and holding in mind the path and living a life that's that's the dhamma that's that's, that's how it works and while david i really appreciate that i think everybody's saying this is a good intro to the truth of happiness i think we should sit with this sutta particularly as an introduction to the dhammapada and see really where it is here every one of the suttas we've gone over in the vipassana are, are teased in here it's yep. the, the passion you, you immediately brings to mind the fire discourse. The release from affliction is mentioned in there. Yeah. They're all mentioned there. Dependent origination yeah. is mentioned specifically in one paragraph. It's it's incredible the Buddha just sets this as a teaser. However, this I would almost encourage everybody to read this one more time and, and think about where we've been over 32 weeks, and you'll see each paragraph is almost a direct reference yeah. to each one of the suttas. It's incredibly an incre uh, you know complete teaching, and so. Um, well, I guess I thought. yeah, that's uh, thank you. I think we're all starting to see that just about every teaching the Buddha ever gave is a complete teaching when you understand the context. In other words, you it took you, you know, a, a bit of study to understand how this fits everything else. Years. And de yeah, and, and dependent origination. If you don't, this is it, it's the license taken with dependent origination that has led to most of the misunderstanding in modern Buddhism. And even the words, we, we've changed the words. Uh, most modern Buddhists would call it dependent co-arising or uh, uh, there's some other, other words that, that don't relate to it. But when you read dependent origination, the Paticca Samuppada Sutta, mm -hmm. it's obvious th there's, there's no room in there to get misled or right. misunderstand it unless you intentionally want to. I've seen some world famous Buddhist teachers do a chalk talk on dependent origination. And they, it, it's, it's remarkable how completely off base it is and it has nothing to do with what the buddha taught but there's that's the problem that's also sort you, of embodied in the sutta with angela Milla. i mean he re, he literally is you know the next moment is now informed by wisdom and and he's literally the, the five aggregates that were his anatta that were this bloodthirsty murderer are now being released yep. um, he's 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 you know unbound from that so now he's I don't know, the middle of the, yeah. the new guy or whatever he, and, and the, the rest of the story is that he became a humanitarian and yeah. helped his fellow humans. And, and the ignorance then is released from him, but now the ignorance is on others who are fabricating that Angela Mill is this killer. And 
I yeah. Will is walking that around was as, such a good point. as a guy now who's not thinking like a killer anymore. Yeah. He's thinking like, how am I going to, you know, it's, he's just, it's not that, but, uh, but so for a mind that's rooted in blame and punishment, you'll go there mm-hmm. and you'll never, you'll never let right. the guy go. You know, that's, uh, that's just human ignorance too. We see it play out in the world all the time. You know? So, I mean, there's people that would say when somebody looks at Angela Miller askance again, because they remember his past, that that's Angela Miller's karma. It's not, not it's the person's mm-hmm. that's thinking that way is mm-hmm. karma. Right. But again, we have such crazy notions of karma. We throw it around like we know what it is. I remember a few years ago when the, the, uh, Japan got hit by a tsunami mm-hmm. and one of the commentators was, well, it's, that's just karma working out. What an awful thing. I mean, it's, it's right. funny, but it's, what it's an awful, like they deserved it. Right. Like people, or, or that they must deserve it because it happened to them. It, it happened because it's, it's part of living in the world. It's dukkha, it's not karma. Um, this is the first of the Dhammapada suttas that I really um, enjoyed. I, it, they take, yeah, <laughs> that's the funny thing. I, I, to me, a lot of the Dhammapada suttas are, uh, get a little bit uh, too pithy uh, or, or, or sometimes too abstract, but this is like very direct, very mm. practical. Yeah. Takes it from one step to the next, and it's yeah, this. This is a beauty. Yeah, it is. Thank you. Well, we did the Brahmana Vaga just uh, two or three weeks ago. I can't mm-hmm. remember, and that was the twenty-sixth chapter. Right. But there's, there's, mm-hmm. they're close. But you can see where the mm-hmm. first to the last mm-hmm. mind governs all. To this is what, this is what an awakened human being is, and it's just a remark. So we're gonna, we're gonna go through it again in the over the summer. I think I'll have the book out by then. I hope to. So we'll see. Eva, good to see you. John, always good to be here. Um, you know, my practice, um, what I find, first of all, is that, yes, definitely being on the cushion is something that, unless you've experienced it, you really can't explain it. Because when I, a lot of things in my life, I know it's only because I happen to sit and meditate because there was nothing that I actually did to make it happen. It's, anyway, here, I'm trying to explain what I can't explain. Anyway, the (laughs) other thing is that um, words, I've had a difficulty in learning a lot of things because my meaning or my understanding of a certain word, like even the word pure, can have such a vast meaning that I can't get here because I'm, battling with all these but what about this but it can be that and you know i kind of just drive myself crazy because i do that with just about every word (laughs) and uh and it's almost like yes it's just like let it go don't think about it so much see what happens when you're meditating see how it applies in your life how you know things do become easier things do stay calmer if i just don't speak or or I do say but I'm careful of what I say or I say what I uh, is more applicable to the situation instead of what I feel like saying and I need to say and uh, I thank you so much John because uh, the bottom line is that you are <laughs> you have become a very important person in my life because no matter where I am in my life I will suddenly say to myself okay be gentle with yourself and I, you taught me that Good. and uh, okay be Quantumism, you taught me that, and uh, thank you so much. Yeah, thank you for all that. It's good to see you again, and you just described uh, a very skillful development of wise restraint. You know, you, you know how to, and that's the Dhamma. That's it. When things are arising, when I feel like I might be losing my mind, <laughs> and I don't, and that's remarkable because I spent the first 30 years of my life at least in a lost mind. It's not pleasant. <laughs> Glad to see you. Hello, Tim. Good morning, everybody. Um, a couple things real quick. Uh, so uh, to what Kevin and what Ron were saying, um, so, you know, this, the, the Dhammapada, you know, they're, they didn't know where to put these chapters, and you can see why, because this is a very condensed version of the longer discourse on this topic. So it's really in your face, <laughs> secondly, yeah. to the point, uh, to Ron's point. Um, but 
you know, the theme from this, you know, is the mindfulness of the defilements and the recognition of them. And I think it's important, and I hope I'm not speaking out of step, for the Sangha to try to stay on point with the sutta that is at hand. Um, and I, again, I say that with all respect for everyone, uh, because I, I think the whole, maybe it's just me, but uh, it gets overwhelming when, we, when, when things get jump around. Getting back to this particular sutta, I, one thing I really felt that resonated was the mind that's agitated. Okay, and how with an agitated mind, you cannot, um, you will suffer and will stop yep. and it will continue. And the, the methods, the, the teaching of recognition of that agitation and that hatred or whatever it is, the self-referential views that will result in agitation. Like you had said, you know, um, you know, someone should be punished is not because that person deserves punishment, it's because you feel that person feels should be punished. It's a mm -hmm. self-referential agitation. So, um, yeah, I'm very excited about the upcoming uh, uh, classes. Uh, this Me is too. A, if this is, if this is <laughs> an indication of what it's going to be like, so. Well, I hope, <laughs> I hope there is inspired. <laughs> uh, we'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. Lisa, good to see you. Good to see you, too, John, and, and everyone online here, wherever. I have a couple questions. Sure. Jada, is that um, the Tamana Vipassana, the, the meditation, um, describing the kind of meditation, is that another, is jhana, or what does that mean, or is that another word for what kind of meditation? Yes. It, this, okay. Oh, I'm sorry. You want to? No. Jhana, jhana means concentration, and it, it, it is what the meditation that the Buddha taught is called. The confusion you have is, is that in the past, I didn't refer to it as Shamatha Vipassana meditation because that there's a couple of suttas where Shamatha, meaning tranquility, and Vipassana, meaning insight, are mentioned, but it really is much more accurate to call it jhana. So in the past year or so, I've been, in fact, I put it up on the website, jhana is Shamatha Vipassana meditation, but the more accurate word or term is jhana because jhana means concentration or a non-distracted state. So we practiced jhana meditation, where a year ago we did shamatha vipassana meditation, but it's the same thing. <laughs> and my second question is, a couple of times you have referred to the cow, is something about the cow is gaining on us. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> 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 I think it's yeah, everything's favorite. And, <laughs> you oh you want me to explain the cow? Yeah. <laughs> oh, uh, it's not a long suit though, we can read it. Oh there's a there's a suit to call there's a suit yeah, there's a few actually. Um there's a, a very a, a suit that I refer to all the time. It's linked on the front page of the uh, in fact it's in the emails now too. It's called the Bahia Sutta. I think the phrase I have is, what is seen, there is only the seen. Um, what it refers to is, uh, Bahia encountered the Buddha one day, implored him to give him the Dhamma teaching. Eventually the Buddha did because he was on his arms around, but he said, okay, I'll give it to you. Give him a very brief teaching on the Dhamma and Four Noble Truths. But he awakened on the spot, walked down the road, got trampled by a cow and killed. And so it's an, <laughs> it's an Sorry, important Bahia. Dhamma teaching, but the but the the teaching is that the cow's chasing all of us, and now is the time to awaken. Not next week, not next year, not when you get around to it, you know, not when the kids are grown. Whatever it is, now is the time to awaken because the cow's chasing. So I use that phrase often. The, the cow and that reflects and, back on impermanence. Impermanence is yeah. is the context for yeah. everything going on. It's a teaching on impermanence and. <laughs> How are you, Jay? Oh, did Lisa, did you have some another question? Did I? Okay. And then I 
went and brought something up and Tim said we should keep on. Oh, come on. <laughs> that what I meant. Okay. <laughs> Are you good, Lisa? Yeah. <laughs> Hello, Jay. Hey. Well, like I say, we've been too many different places in this discussion for me to focus on the whole thing. And I'm just going to say that I am wobbling my way down the eightfold path. <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe the, the next, well, I think the, the next uh, 13 weeks will be good for you. Huh? Hurt. Hi, Barbara. Hi, good to see you again. As much as I can see you, it's good to see you again. Thank you. Uh, I'm just a little overwhelmed because it's all very new to me in yeah. a different way. Yeah. And, and so again, the, the importance of being gentle with yourself. These are things you, you haven't heard much of. The, but it will become, as Kevin just said, it'll become commonplace you know very quickly so uh, again always be gentle with yourself and i hope you can continue to join us michael uh just going to say thank you for clarity on a lot of the things that we uh that came up here and uh, put everything in focus and where it should be and noble sound uh, glad you're here hello julia hello john um i'm just going to say one little thing that this kind of issue that kind of reminds me of it's kind of like you should be in the eye of the beholder. Huh. So life is in the in the in the mind. It, it, the way life unfolds is in the mind of the you know of yeah. the beholder. Yeah. And so uh, just something simple like that to, to remember. It's it's our state, you know, our state of being, our mental state of being that we define all all our, all our that's it. our world. That's all I have to say. That's, yeah, that's a good <laughs> and, and, and very profound. That's the Dhamma. That's, that's what this sutta is about. That's what they're all about. Um, so, again, right after our spring retreat, we're going to go through the Dhammapada. I think I should have it published, but either way, we're going to go through it. As far as the Truth of Happiness, so the, the Truth of Happiness course starts right now. Um, you will read, books. yeah, I have some books here. At, at, um, and also on the homepage, the, I put the, the whole book is online there. If you want to just refer to chapter by chapter um, in a drop down menu. Um, this week you will read the preface, the introduction and the first chapter, which is on Shemata Vipassana or Jhana meditation. I haven't gotten to change the books yet. Um, and then I will teach that. I'll talk briefly about it and then and we'll discuss it. So the way this is going to be, it's slightly different than we've done in the past is that I want to, in the end of each chapter, there's some instructions on how to write a little, if you're doing a correspondence course with me, write it out, what your understandings are. So if you want to do this, you don't have to, um, write out what you've learned out of the preface, the introduction, and the first chapter. And next week, I want to hear it. We're going to have a, a Simon discussion. That's how we're going to go through this. So again, the preface, introduction, and the uh, chapter on Shemat Vipassana. Uh, and the same class will be Tuesday, so the same instructions on Tuesday, but we'll have a different uh, sutta from the Dhammapada on Tuesday. Is, is everybody clear on that? Okay. Yeah, not, not all that complicated. One thing? Yes. Ron might uh, also echo this, um, and you've said this before, and I've done this book before, but you say try and write down what you're learning, and, and while that may be difficult to write the Dhamma, I think that you really want to, tr if you can, try it out, because you'll find a different understanding. It'll, it'll make you extrapolate and articulate this and really apply it where we're talking about in, in here, in, in your mind. And we're learning this now and, and probably wish I'd started three years ago or so doing that. But, but yeah, just if it's two sentences <laughs> and, and it's between you and John, John, you're such a good writer. And with this, it, it's, it's a really good process for you all to try if you'd like to take your practice yeah. to a, a, another level uh, not to use that as a, it's not levels but to another level of understanding yeah, that's and, good, and i'd encourage that's right. it because it's it's you'll find things you didn't know or understand will will be lit up yeah. thank you, kevin I, I, kevin is just is so right he's he's understanding that now because he's doing it uh during a teacher's training there's subtleties of the dhamma that i don't think i would have realized if i if i didn't write it out uh, writing something out you just you're using different parts of your brain so it makes sense that it would it would increase your learning so i really encourage you to you're read what you're reading good. and even if it's just a paragraph or two just write out what you learned and bring it back to class next week and uh that, that will be the 
the, the, that's how we're going to do this Donna study. I think you're all going to get a lot out of it. And again, there's books over there, but it's also online. Uh, you can oh, uh, uh, John, the, could could you could you navigate for me where this this book is going to be? I mean, I'm at your um, becoming Buddha front page. Okay, um, just scroll down to Truth of Happiness uh, 2020 Truth of Happiness Sangha study. I think it says. Oh, okay, and then uh, then then there's the correspondence course below, and click that. No, go just below the correspondence course is the 2020 Sangha Dharma study. That's it. Click okay, click that. And then you'll see the individual chapters there, correct? Uh, yeah, week one, week two, yeah. Okay. All right. And so is week one that we're gonna that you'll start? Yeah. Um, the preface. The, yep. The preface, the introduction, and the the first chapter. Gotcha. Okay, thank you. Yeah, good. Um, I think that's all, right? Okay. Is there any? Uh, we'll finish with meta as we always do. Um, yeah, that's it. Well, I feel like I got something else to say, but I always have something else to say. <laughs> Truth that happens. Uh, the registration for our fall retreat is up and ready to go. If you're going uh, spring retreat, if you're going. Um, and you know you're going, please register as soon as you can. Uh, let me call up the... Uh, all right, we'll finish with Meta. Now find your relaxed meditation posture and just take a few moments to become mindful of your in-breath and your out-breath. Bring your mind into your body. And these are the Buddha's words on Meta from the Karaniya Meta Sutta. This is what should be done by one who is skilled in goodness and who knows the path of peace. Let them be able and upright, straightforward and gentle in speech, humble and not conceited, contented and easily satisfied, unburdened with duties and frugal in their ways, peaceful and calm and wise and skillful, not proud or demanding in nature. Let them not do the slightest thing that the wise would later reprove, wishing in gladness and in safety, may all beings be at ease. Whatever living beings there may be, whether they are weak or strong, omitting none, the great or the mighty, medium, short, or small, the seen and the unseen, those living near and far away, excuse me, those born and to be born, may all beings be at ease. Let none deceive another or despise any being in any state. Let none through anger or ill will wish harm upon another. Even as a mother protects with her life, her child, her only child. So with a boundless heart should one cherish all living beings. Radiating kindness over the entire world, spreading upwards to the skies and downwards to the depths, outwards and unbounded, freed from hatred and ill will. Whether standing or walking, seated or lying down, Free from drowsiness, one should sustain this recollection. This is said to be the sublime abiding. By not holding to fixed views, the pure-hearted one, having clarity of vision, being free from all sense desires, is not born again into this world. Thank you all for a wonderful class this morning. Peace. Thank you, Dathane. Thank you, Thad. Good to say hi to Dathane. I want to say hi. Hey, Dathane, you remember this guy here? Yeah. <laughs> and Rob, too. Yeah, how you doing? How you doing? <laughs> hey, nice to see you. Rev, former, the former Reverend Dason. Yes, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Good to see you. Thanks so Good much. Glad you. Yeah. you guys joined today.